everybody. Welcome to the last lecture. And uh, Vlad, for part five. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around. I think I uh, screwed up here. It didn't play any role so far. But I guess for posterity, it may be better that I fix this. Um, there's something missing here. It's RQ inverse, MQ inverse. I could just take the, uh, I could just say that, oh, you know, we hadn't even defined RQ, so I did that on purpose, but no, actually, I just forgot. <laughs> That's, it's a mistake. So it, it, just fix that if you want. Okay, so we've discussed, we've discussed so far only the cancellation of the previous stress. So the stress is canceled. Everybody else who's left here has to go into RQ plus one. So we better estimate all these terms. Now they're split off typically into three pieces. This piece, it's a material derivative of the perturbation. This is sometimes called the transport error. Um, there's this piece in which you stretch your perturbation by the deformation matrix of your previous uh, velocity. And this is the object that is also when you do isometric embedding problems, none of the others exist. And that's why this is called the Nash error. Isometric embedding problem is di times dj is gij, where the metric is. So only terms like this. What's really left then is the high frequency part of this. And that's called oscillation error because it oscillates. This is also the only nonlinear one. Uh, these are linear errors as opposed when considered as functions of the perturbation. That's the easiest one is the Nash error. So let's try to do estimates for Nash. First of all, let me write down schematically what this is. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Jessica. So that's what we have. But of course, if we want to put this into, we need to put this into divergence form. The other, we don't need to estimate the divergence of the stress, but the inverse. Now this object has zero mean because this is really the divergence of somebody. Like I can put this out as a divergence. So of course it has zero mean, so it can be written as a divergence. Is there a smart way to write it as a divergence? One way to write it as a divergence would be just to say, well, I'm gonna define divergence inverse to be the gradient of the Laplacian inverse. That's an inverse of the divergence. It acts on zero mean function. Uh, the problem with doing that is when you invert the Laplacian, you smear out. The That's not even the worst thing. Remember that this has a certain localization to level sets. You really need to maintain that localization to level sets. So you can't afford to smear out, not necessarily the tubes, but this localization. Let me do a schematic of how this inversion of the divergence works. So I told you that this tube, so let's say we have the following setup. We have a slow function times another slow function. It's a slow function, okay? Little g is a slow function multiplied by this tube. Now this tube, we said it, it's something pointing in a direction C and it's some object with an incredibly high moment. So it's the Laplacian to the 2n of somebody. Okay. And this is fast and this is slow. Periodize at a certain scale, et cetera, et cetera. So how can you write this as an inverse divergence? Well, one of those two Laplacians, you write as divergence of the gradient. And then you write this as divergence of G Xi gradient Laplacian to the two N minus one of rho. Please let's not worry about symmetrizing. This is not a symmetric stress. You can symmetrize it, okay? Let's not worry about that. But of course you make an error. And that error is gradient G psi gradient. Uh, wait, uh, there's a contraction happening here. So you have written one object as an inverse divergence. Let's first analyze the object we have succeeded in writing. What we have done is we have essentially removed a derivative from the fast function. So you could imagine that by removing a derivative from the fast function, you have gained the frequency of the fast function. Okay, And this I will always use that the inverse divergence gains the frequency of the function it's applied to. How about this one though? This is not in divergence form. Well, but guess what? I can commute this. And now I'm gonna repeat, rinse and repeat. So this is the divergence of the same thing uh, minus the divergence of 
Xi, gradient G, Hessian, Laplacian 2n minus 2 of rho, and now it's plus Xi, Hessian G, Hessian, Laplacian to the 2n minus 2 of rho. And you keep doing. By the way, if let's compare these two guys. Which one's worse? When you compare these two, uh, yeah, it's okay. When you compare these two objects, the difference is that this gradient is here. And this is a fast function. So this object is bigger. So in fact, the first term in this parametric, this is just a parametric expansion, okay? The first term in this parametric expansion is the dominant one, and all others are smaller. Now you keep on doing this up to level as much as you can. At some point, you're stuck. But by that point, you have gained the quotient of slow frequency to fast frequency to the power n. That's a small, small, small number. But you have gained it by that time. At that time, apply the usual one. It smears things out. But although it smears things out, it has such a small amplitude that it doesn't matter because you've gained so much by the time you've gone to that last term in the parametrics that it's obliterated. Okay, so that's how the, ah, and the whole point of this is that all these stresses that you get <coughs> contain G and its derivatives. So in particular, all these stresses are supported on the support of G. I'm going to invert the divergence here. When I'm going to invert the divergence here, the resulting object will be supported on the same support as this, and in particular on the support of A. And A has the level set cutoffs. The object that's getting spit out of the inverse divergence, modulo this last term in the expansion, which doesn't matter, has correct support. So this is for free an inverse divergence operator by hand. Sorry, not for free. It's an inverse divergence operator by hand, which has the same support. So you don't have to appeal to the abstract Bogovsky operator. And the reason that that's nice, that whatever I'm going to get here, of course, I'm going to throw into RQ plus one. And then I'm going to have to not just estimate this thing, but also its derivatives. Now, the space derivatives commute with inverse divergence, so they're fine. How about the material? If you were just to write this using the Bogovsky operator, the commutator between the material derivatives and the Bogovsky operator, you don't want to go there. It's a mess. The fact that this is explicit means that I'm just going to apply material derivatives to this, to, uh, sorry, to this. And I'm just going to do product rules, you know? So it's, that's, that's why we do this rather than an abstract operator. It's nicer to have it by hand. OK, so let's see the size now. Press, so we need to estimate it in L1 and in L infinity. So let's start with L1. So L1 norm of a single term. Let's not worry about the sum over six elements, okay? Gains frequency. Which frequency the fast one? So there's a one over lambda Q plus one. Now due to homework four, this is the product of a slow function and the function which is periodized to scale lambda Q plus one RQ inverse. That's the role of this kappa in the homework. So I can do L1 times L1. They're too slow guys. So I can't do one more time the trick. <laughs> so there I have to do Hölder. So times a xi in L2, that's you, gradient bq in L2, and then the building block in L1. There's just the LP decoupling lemma here. Now, do we have estimates for all of those? Yes, we do. So I have tried to convince you that a xi in L infinity is delta q plus, in L2, sorry, is delta q plus one to the one half. This by induction in L2 was, Lambda Q, Delta Q to the one half. One in L1, remember that we at some point wrote, uh, it's not here, all the LP norms, building blocks, and the LP norm was RQ to the two over P minus one. The L1 norm is RQ to the two over one minus one, which is one. That's the size. Question, is it less than what we have to make it less than? And that is, Delta Q plus strictly less because they're implicit constants. So now we're going to have to do the unpleasantness of actually writing down what these parameters are. I want to do one term honestly 
and then I'll wave my hands for the rest. The question mark is equivalent to, all right, so what am I going to use? Lambda Q plus one is lambda Q to the B, super exponential growth, and delta Q is lambda Q to the minus two beta. These are the only things I need to remember for myself. So I'm going to slap this in here, and we're going to have the following. RQ times, remember, we don't know what RQ is. This is lambda Q to the one minus beta. This is lambda Q to the minus um, beta B. This is lambda Q to the minus B. And I'm gonna put this on the other side. So that's lambda Q to the two beta B squared. And this has to be less than one. And you do an algebra now, and you remember that B is more than one, and beta is a bit less than one half, which I need to convince you, by the way, at some point that I can't go above one half. Remember to remind. And if you just spell this out and you just keep track, okay, you get that RQ needs to be less than the quotient of the lambdas to the one half up to some dimensional constant. And that's okay, it's a sanity check. This is a small number. So, okay, we have one constraint on RQ. And if that's satisfied, then at least in L1, the Nash error has the correct size. Now let's worry about the L infinity size of the Nash. So I'm gonna estimate the same thing, but in L infinity. So in L infinity, I don't have to worry about Hölder's inequality. I gain from the inverse divergence a lambda Q plus one, and then I have A psi in L infinity, gradient V Q in L infinity, and then the building block in L infinity. That's, the, that's what we get. Do we know all these terms? Yes, we know. A psi in L infinity is gradient V Q in L infinity. I guess this is important. <laughs> this is why I had to fix this. <laughs> gradient V Q in L infinity, I don't know where to point to. <laughs> Sorry, but always you can get stuff from V because V is the summation of the W's. And so you always have, so let me convince you then uh, otherwise. First object in there is the last thing you've added. So that, that gradient acting on the last thing costs Lambda Q and the L infinity norm of that last thing is the L infinity norm of the last building block. And two over infinity minus, remember it's two P, two over P minus one. Two over infinity minus one is negative one. It's R Q minus one inverse. This you get by just saying it's the last thing that I added was the worst object. And now here I have the same thing, R Q inverse. And now this has to be lesser equal one. So again, you remember what these things are, but I'm gonna have to remember one more thing because I have Q minus one and Q there, okay? And just like I said, this R Q minus R Q is R Q minus one to the B because everything is super geometric, okay? Everything is super geometric. Put this out and you get that R Q has to be bigger or equal up to a dimensional constant, same number as before. And keep in mind, all my greater equals are up to dimensional constants. So believe me that I can deal with that. What this shows is that the Nash error satisfies both the L1 bound and the L infinity bound that you want. But to do so, you have only one choice from the intermittency parameter. There's no sec, there's no other choice, okay? RQ has to exactly be in the geometric mean uh, between the two objects. And we call this thing the one half intermittency rule. So the outcome is at least this RQ is equal to this. And we call this the one half intermittency rule. It's solely on the Nash error. Now, of course, now we don't have any more free parameters. So we better hope that the other things are okay. But just to make sure, the last line here with the R2, like if I, if I do n equals zero, n equals one, is it really the bounding point? It don't want the R2 inverse to act on the, the guy which is the, the power n? 
Okay, thank you. The, the last line uh, in, in this uh, word on the left. Yes. Um, when you set n equals zero. N is equal to zero. And, and the n equals one. Yes. Don't you want some RQ with this expression? The cost of the. Well, let, let, let me see if I understand what you're saying. I feel that uh, we use the lambda two RQ as the minus one inverse. Yes, one. you're correct. So what did I screw up here? The one in the circle. The one in the circle needs an R Q minus one inverse or an R Q inverse. Oh, I can't believe I made a mistake. Yes. Thank you, Jean Christophe. Thank you, Matt. And of course, if we had actually done the algebra, it wouldn't have worked out then. Wait. Oh, you were correct with that. Yeah. Oh, this is correct because it's a stress. It's a stress. Okay, I got confused a bit. Okay, sorry about that. So now it's okay. All right, uh, what was I doing? Ah, we talked about the Nash error. So now let's talk about the transport error. So this one's fine. So we need to talk about the transport error. Maybe I can switch boards. Can, can I ask just one question about, so you have this, the one half intermittency rule. Is there some physical way to, to think about this now? I mean, it's saying something very specific about the, the volumes being related to the, uh, yes. Frequencies. Um, if you remember the uh, Frisch's beta model, this is dimension two in Frisch's beta model. Right, so it's the, the, that clear monofractal scaling. It's a monofractal scaling with two as the dimension of the monofractal. That's the physical. Talk a little bit about the transport error. So this is, oh, I'm sorry, Jessica. As you can see, I'm uh, running on fumes here. So this has essentially two terms by the product rule. Once it hits the amplitude functions, the building block, once it hits the building block, the block is fast. If the material derivative hits it, you're screwed. So you better make that equal to zero. That equal to zero, remember that so far these building blocks are just these tubes. They don't even depend on time. So how am I gonna make this equal to zero? Throughout my ansatz, I was saying that I lied to you because the ansatz is not in Eulerian, it's, it's in Lagrangian. Actually, these building blocks are not these, they're composed with a flow map. Whose flow map? <laughs> the flow map was this of this vector field. So the inverse of the Lagrangian map, and then this is zero. So that's great because this was the fastest uh, guy in the galaxy. So we need to talk about this now. Can you even define these flow maps? I've been harping about this. To define flow maps, you need Lipschitz vector fields. So to even mention these flow maps, I need to restrict myself to level sets. Let's say that I'm also summing over level sets. So they depend on I somehow, and then this flow map depends on I. And let's pretend for the moment that the level sets are two to the I level sets. They're not, but let's pretend. So first of all, my timeline, zero to T, fix the level set, I have a Lipschitz norm. It depends on i. It depends on 2 to the i. <laughs> so my, Lipsch my local Lipschitz norm in this picture would be tau q 2 to the minus i, right? So I chop this off into pieces like that. On each one of those intervals, I can solve for the flow map. So in fact, <laughs> I also need a partition of unity in time indexed by a different parameter, k. And phi i k is the identity to solve the first order or the initial conditions. <laughs> phi i k is the identity at k times this. These are flow maps and they're now well-defined. Okay, great. And in order to do so, let's pretend that the gradient VQ dependence, we've already talked, talked about the RQ dependence of this when we had the cancellation of the stress. So let's pretend that the gradient VQ dependence is that a xi i k restricts you to the level set um, gradient v to that space-time level set. Sorry? Tau q, there's a tau q. There's a tau q. Uh, so these are level sets. Maybe you smooth them a little bit, okay? You're kind of not in good shape because if that's your thing, it's a smooth cutoff of that level set, how do you estimate the material derivative of that cutoff? Because you have to estimate it. The material derivative of that cutoff needs you to require, uh, requires you to know the real derivative of that on this level set. But you don't know that. If I just chop off a function, I'm not gonna know what the derivative is 
of that function on that level set. So this level set also needs to carry information about this with a different chopping. Also need to chop the values of that, which is also an L2 function. You also need to chop that with a different index, but then you have to compute the material derivative of that and you're gonna require the second material derivative. So it also needs to depend on this. How are you gonna estimate that you're gonna chop it into pieces? And so designing these cutoffs into level sets has cost us, I don't know, 50 pages. It, it's just horrendous. Uh, and if anybody has a smart way of doing this, we would greatly appreciate uh, letting us know. So essentially what we do is we're writing, I feel like I need to erase something important now. No, I'll erase this because it's not important. Hey Vlad, can I ask a, a stupid question? I'm sure it's not stupid, Scott. Why don't the geometry of these sets, call it, like you're not keeping track of the geometry of these sets? Like they could be wild, no? What, what exactly do you mean by geometry? I just mean like the place where this guy's gradient is between two, you know, constants like this could be a set with very crazy geometry. And I would imagine that would hurt you. Yes, it does. So we need to somehow convexify all these level sets. But so imagine you have a function like this. So this level set, nothing. But on this level set, oh my God, the gradient, you have to chop it off into pieces. And you're right, this could look horrendous. So that's part of the 50 pages. But it's actually worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say we have a cutoff. This cutoff is indexed not just by i, but it's an i0, i1, i to some level. Denotes the two to the i's with which we've cut every single one of these objects. So it's indexed by one of these things. And in there, we have all sorts of things. We have gradient of VQ, we have DTQ of gradient VQ. Um, it doesn't work. The reason is this. Um, DT, remember that these don't commute. At some point you have to write DTQ is really DTQ minus one plus v, uh, WQ dot grad. You know everything about this, but now you need to know stuff about this. But you only know stuff about this on the support of some other cutoff indexed by many things. Since there's now a product over Q of these cutoffs, all have different indices. And after 50 pages, you have designed some cutoffs with the following property. It chops up a function and in addition, it satisfies the same derivative and material derivative estimates as your original function. Nothing gets screwed. Everything gets screwed by a factor of two. Anyway, so you do this. Once you do this, the size of this object is slow now. So you can put it in L1. This you can also put in L1. And believe me, it satisfies exactly the same bounds as the Nash area. It's exactly the same. So I'm gonna check this off uh, rather cavalier, but let's check it out. And now comes the real trouble. So, so far, this was really, really the easy part of the paper. The oscillation error. Oh, how should I even start this? Uh, okay, oscillation error. So this is the high frequency part, divergence, WQ plus one, tensor WQ plus one. Write this. So this is the divergence of sum over, luckily it's a, we've made sure that the pipes don't touch. The fact that the pipes don't touch even after we compose with the Lagrangian flows, that's a mess because they bend and they bend with different flows. I'm dropping notation. I'm not writing all indices. Maybe. Now, just like the material derivative, it can either land on the amplitudes or on the building block. So you can either have, or you can have this times the divergence, but we've designed these things to be to leading order stationary solutions of oil. So when the divergence hits them, you should get a pressure gradient. But in fact, they didn't even have pressure. To leading order, you get zero. So believing that this is somehow the prototype. Of course, we need to inverse, invert the divergence. What I wrote is not entirely true because we've already used the mean of this to cancel the stress. 
So this is just a piece of this minus the mean. I use projection not equal to zero to denote f minus the mean of f. Okay, so now let's do a naive estimate. How much time do I have? Okay, let's just do a naive estimate. Inverse divergence gains the frequency of the object it's applied to. What is the frequency of this object? This is slow, right? So let's not even worry about it. What's the frequency of this object? So remember, you take two functions, they're periodic at this scale, multiply them, and you subtract the mean. So if I have periodicity n, then sine squared nx, projection not equal to zero, is also known as minus one half cosine two nx, lives at the frequency, which is essentially the same periodization rate. <laughs> it's the same. So this is a problem because Although these guys were fast, meaning they were thin, once you've subtracted the mean, the mean is a constant that made it not thin anymore. It's essentially a constant, it has two tiny blubs. So this is not the product, sorry, the non-zero, the, the projection on non-zero modes of this product does not live at frequency lambda q plus one. It lives at frequency this. And in particular, we know what RQ is, right? Well, let's, let's not even pretend we knew. It lives at that frequency. So when you invert the divergence and you do an L1 estimate, this in L1, you're not gonna gain lambda Q plus one, you're gonna gain this. First, you can estimate now, L1 norm. So you're gonna do your freshman's Hölder's inequality, L1 times L1. The L1 norm of this, you can only do the L2 norm squared. Fadient costs the old frequency. And the L1 norm of the square is again the L2 norm square. So this is one over. L2 norm of this by definition was one, lambda Q. And this was delta Q plus one. All right, so question, is this lesser equal delta Q plus two? Because remember, it's a stress. This part of the computation should answer Vincent's question about why is one half regularity the best you can possibly ever do? Keep in mind that because of the Nash error, we actually know what RQ is. But let's pretend I don't know, right? This estimate becomes worse the smaller RQ is. So even if I live in some dreamland and I take RQ to be one, which is the biggest it can be, right? Even then, that inequality becomes lambda Q delta Q plus one, lambda Q plus one inverse, less or equal delta Q plus two. If you spell everything out, this is equivalent to two beta B strictly less than one. B is a number strictly larger than one. So beta can be at most a half. But to get it a half, you have to choose this. But we don't have this. RQ is much. We've made all these choices and we have an error term that just does not satisfy the bound that we want. This then causes the perfect part of the proof. So let me draw now a picture. Frequency lambda Q. This is where all my errors lived at the beginning. Here is frequency lambda Q plus one and I'm adding perturbations here, right? Which have that this frequency. I've canceled this. I've obtained good things. Except I'm left with some junk, which is that junk, which satisfies the wrong estimate. What frequency does the junk live at? It lives at this frequency, lambda Q plus one RQ. We've said it. Well, two, lambda Q plus one to the one half, lambda Q to the one half. So it lives exactly at the geometric mean. So we fixed this junk, but we got new junk. It satisfies slightly better bounds but not good enough bounds that we can just check it off. It's a bit better, right, than what I started with, because I do gain a little bit, but I just don't gain enough. So guess what? You don't need to correct this in the same exact way. So you add the new perturbation at the same frequency, you know. But now this is designed not to cancel this, but to cancel. So this presents, in principle, two sets of difficulties. Number one. When I add this to correct that, I'm gonna get a Nash, a transport and an oscillation. If we are a bit smart, the Nash and transport are gonna be checked off just like they were here. It's gonna be an oscillation part and it's not good enough. 
So it's going to be moved half, one half intermittency rule. It's going to be moved here. This is assuming that when I add these new, new, new pipes, remember that we worked quite hard so that these pipes don't touch each other even after they bend. I'm adding new pipes. These new pipes have a different intermittency parameter because the RQ I used here was the geometric mean of these, but the RQ I need to use there is the geometric mean of these. So they have a different intermittency parameter, meaning different thickness. So I have my old pipes, they were bent and they don't touch, and I'm putting new pipes in, they're thicker. How can I make sure they don't touch? <laughs> with the old ones, not these amongst themselves, but these. Also these among themselves, by the way, because they're thicker. Let's say you could solve this. Then you would iterate, add new things, and you keep on pushing this dyadically, log many times. And once you've pushed it here, you're done. But all of this works assuming that you solve this pipe dodging problem. You keep on adding pipes of different thickness and of different bends. And there were already pipes living there. You don't wanna stack them on top of each other. This is in some way the combinatorial part, not in some way, this is the combinatorial part of the proof. Not be able to fully articulate what goes in here, but let me give you a sketch. So a lot of the things that I'm talking about, a lot of this heavy technology about cutoffs and stuff like this, we already had this worked out in a paper with Matt, Tristan, and Nader, but we didn't get the correct exponents. And this is the part in, this is one of the four new things that were required to actually get the right exponents. So imagine the following setup. You have a region. This region is the support of a cutoff and it's living in the box, okay? And this region is inhabited, is inhabited by pieces of bent pipes. I don't even know how to draw them. They're many and they have different thickness maybe, okay? They were there from previous steps in your construction. Make some assumptions. You know that you've added them before, so you know their thickness. In addition, if you're smart, you can localize your problem to a region in space-time as long as you don't violate these constraints. So if you're careful, not only do you know the widths of these guys, but you also know that you only have to look at this problem on a certain size domain, because you can localize your problem somehow. It's a different localization than the cutoffs. It's yet another one. Um, so now let's say you want to put in a pipe of this thickness. Sorry, it's not the thickness, it's the periodization rate, which is the trouble. They all have the same thickness, lambda Q plus one inverse. It's the periodization rate, which is different. Some of them are more often than others. So you want to put this periodized at the correct scale in there. This is in three dimensions, okay? So what you can do, let me put some quantifiers. <clears throat> so let's say this is lambda Q plus two, uh, one R2 inverse, and that the periodization rate of the pipes is at most of the existing pipes, the periodization rates is at most lambda Q plus one R1. They're bent. You assume that they were bent by nice things. You constructed that. So then you need to insert a new pipe, periodize at a certain rate. So you draw the square here, which is the projection. And in each one of these squares, some choices to make. Where do I put the pipe? Here or there or there. And once you choose one of these, by periodization, you've chosen them all. So you need to choose one of these such that after you insert pipes, you miss all these bent pipes. So what you do is you project these bent pipes onto this plane and you look at the shadow they create. They're gonna create some shadow. That shadow, you kind of know its area. Now, of course, just because you know the area of a set doesn't mean you know much about the set, but you remember that these pipes were not just bent by arbitrary things. They were bent by Lipschitz vector, locally Lipschitz vector fields. So in particular, we have an estimate on the curvature. So when I project this down and we have an estimate on the orientation, we have orientation and curvature. So I can not just know the area of the set, but it's actually looking like a set would look like if it were regular of that area. And then you check that area as a quotient to this area. And because it's a regular set, 
you can get an estimate on how many of these things are free, meaning not covered by the shadow. That estimate requires a condition on this with respect to that. Magic things is that the condition is R1, uh, sorry, R2 squared is lesser R1. It's the one half intermittency rule. That's the huge surprise that I don't think we even imagined would happen. The thing that allows you to do the pipe dodging is the one half intermittency rule yet again. And that's what allows the proof to work after some argument. That's what allows us then to do these iterations, push the stress to higher and higher levels, and at some point close the induction. And at the risk, so that I don't embarrass myself, I'm gonna stop here. <laughs> Are there any questions for Vlad? Did you also use, oh, at some point, did you also use uh, gluing like in uh, yeah. Phil's paper? Like, did no. you use gluing? No, the glu gluing refers to the fact that you could take exact solutions of Euler, glue them with a partition of unity in time. You don't get a solution of Euler, but at least it only makes error where the partition of unity transitions from one to zero. So it kind of localizes the error to certain time slices. Here, everything is space time. So there is no, there's no time slice whatsoever at which I know that I have a uniform Lipschitz estimate. These level sets are all space time pictures. So I cannot do gluing. What was going on with this, uh, this K parameter that you had? Like you're estimating material derivatives on a bunch of intervals indexed in K. Yeah, so I had, I had to build in my cutoff function a time cutoff. So my cutoff function didn't just chop off level sets, it also chopped off time, that's all. And that was because I, I would not be allowed to let the Lagrangian flow longer than the Lipschitz time scale. But it's, it was not related to gluing. Okay, you don't view this as a mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. I had a question. When you insert the pipes? Yes. It seems that you, you insist on uh, preserving periodicity across the, like, uh, and at least from, from what we've seen, we could have the impression that you could just, um, like on each uh, cell decide to, like the important thing is that there is one pipe per, 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 per cell box, but- uh, It could differ. But yeah. The problem with that is that that wouldn't quite be an exact solution of Euler. Because on, if you are on a cell and you have a pipe like this, and in the other cell next to it, if you don't continue, I, when you compute Euler, you're gonna have a distribution. I, uh, or you could even have something the, the, worse, the, worse the, than a distribution. The, the drawing made me... So could, in, in the drawing, when, when the things are aligned to... Like, you could imagine you, at least in one direction, you, you have some freedom, I guess. Yeah, there's, on, on there's the a drawing, shift. On, on the drawing, it seems that there is one extra degree of freedom. There is a shift design. freedom, but once you choose that shift for one little subcell, it's the same shift for all of them. You don't get to mess with the shift from subcell to subcell. It's the same shift for all subcells. And the, the reason is that you can't just put pipe segments. This I understand, but uh, there are multiple pipe segments which are disjoint uh, in the, uh, and, and, and these are also, that position seem to be rigid, uh, like jointly, and, and, but they, you, know, you could move them without uh, making a seg uh, pipe segments. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. But you do not do sure I Okay, well, I understand. I think morally speaking, the answer uh, to answer your question is sort of yes. Uh, those those different uh, prisms, each of which is going to hold a pipe. Morally speaking, you can pretend as if you're placing them one at a time. That introduces some difficulties because the scale between pipes is not the characteristic length scale of R cube. Localized at sort of an inappropriate. Uh, length scale, but uh, uh, miraculously, it, it 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 doesn't hurt you in the in the end. But morally speaking, uh, I think we are doing what you're saying, where you're placing these pipes one at a time. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, here. All right. Thank you for the lecture. So, what's the next direction after what's this? The next direction. Yeah, in this business. So, Matt already outlined the open problems. So. The, the big, big problem. So we have now this proof of the Onsager conjecture that matches the physics, right? But you may say, so what? I mean, 
there was another proof before. Um, there is also the strong version of the onsider conjecture, which requires the pointwise energy inequality, not the global energy. It appears that the existing proofs, namely that of Phil, just simply can never not get close to that. It is uh, the belief that this proof could potentially solve the strong onsider conjecture. And I think that's a beautiful open problem. I'm not working on it, but uh, it's conceivable that with these methods, we could actually solve the strong on cyber conjecture. That would be a major breakthrough. Yeah. So uh, right. there are classical like example papers by Shunir or Schaefer on no unique solutions. And also in the context of dispersive PD, there's a paper by Christ using the same argument. I mean, adding these mm -hmm. things on the higher higher frequency, but much more primitive way. And then I asked this question to Phil, I guess, when he was defending his thesis about that many years ago. But then, so what <laughs> can you imagine to do for the dispersive or even a non-dispersive example, like a Sego equation or this kind of things? Uh, so there's a paper that we have with Tristan for Navier Stokes, right? And in that paper, the Laplacian is treated as an error. In particular, if you put plus Laplacian or minus Laplacian, it does not matter. And if you put I times Laplacian, it does not matter. So there are certain things that can be done uh, in very supercritical regions. Can all dispersive PDs get treated? I do not know. But I think at least this intermittent proof, so not the proof that I said had when he was a student, this new proof, actually can treat some dispersive PDs. And the other methods, I don't know of anybody to have written a paper, but it's certainly doable. And you suppose that the higher dimensions are easier? Higher dimensions. You have more freedom. Easier. Yes, absolutely. Mm, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I just uh, curious a bit about the uh, convex integration for transport equation. Um, could you comment a bit on that? What equation? Transport. Uh, transport. Ah, transport equation. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you view the transport equation as a linear equation, namely when you design the vector field U and mm -hmm. you let the data be anything, mm -hmm. anything you want, yeah. this won't work because this fundamentally uses that you have a nonlinear PDE. Now, if on the other hand you say, I'm not gonna view the transport equation as a linear PDE. I construct at the same time, the vector field and mm -hmm. the data for the transport equation. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden you have a nonlinear PDE because you construct two things. And then mm -hmm. everything I said works. And there are many papers of this on the subject done by Modena and Sekelihidi and Chesky Doven Luo and uh, uh, Colombo, uh, Brue and Delelis. There are many papers, but they're all doing somehow, they're viewing the transport equation as a nonlinear PDE in which they construct not just the vector field, which transports and mixes things around, but at the same time, they construct the data. Obtaining mm -hmm. results such as this, where you only construct the vector field, but the data can be any analytic function, yeah. can fundamentally not work by convex integration. Because okay. this uses nonlinearity in a very fundamental way. So you mean if I do not change the uh, like uh, coefficient uh, and the solution as a pair to 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 yes. uh, follow all of the calculation here, but I treat them independently, then it's almost impossible to follow this kind of techniques. Yes, that you're correct. It's it's not possible. Okay. So it's even not possible. Okay, I see the point. Thank you very much. No problem. Any other questions for Vlad? Well, I think in light of the last couple uh, uh, questions being very uh, forward facing, I think this is an appropriate time to end. Let's thank Vlad one more time. I think uh, maybe what's, uh, what's more important is that we thank the organizers and the local staff who have uh, kept us going for two weeks. So I think. Uh,